Okay, it's time to wander back in, and we'll get started. All right, welcome back, everyone. Um, we wanted to acknowledge um, our media sponsors um, today. Uh, we have three of them who have done an excellent job in getting the word out about um, this meeting uh, today, and that would be uh, 50 Plus Marketplace News and Harvey. Oh, there he is. Harvey's been great in taking pictures and videos of um, our event today. Also, Primetime for Seniors, a senior newspaper. Um, they've done a great job of promoting our event, as well as the Seniors Resource Guide, and that would be Corinne Hall, who is in the sound booth. So thank you to all three of our media sponsors. And hopefully, all of you have had a chance to um, check out the tables in the lobby there. There's a lot of information, really great information for seniors, uh, information on communities and services and transportation and other things. So um, please make sure you check those out uh, as well. Okay. Here's part of the aging process is the reading glasses. Cannot see without them. Okay. So, at this time, we are going to give out the Governance Award, uh, and I'm going to bring Kip Bishop up to do that. to go through everything that we talked about earlier, but Casey Becker is now here. Representative Becker was instrumental in the uh, passing of Senate Bill 17267, uh, which was a bipartisan effort uh, to save rural hospitals. Uh, Representative Becker is now with us, and Representative Becker, if you would. It's our great pleasure uh, from the senior lobby to recognize your effort on behalf of uh, the, the legislature and the hard work that you do. Uh, we want to thank you very much for the, the effort. And uh, if everyone would, Representative Becker. Thank, thank you so much, Bob. Uh, Kip, I was saying Bob. I, Bob. I don't know who Bob Bishop is. Yeah. <laughs> um, Thank you all. I'm Casey Becker. I'm a, the House Majority Leader, and I'm a state representative from uh, Boulder. I represent Boulder, but also um, uh, four rural counties, Gilpin, Clear Creek, Grand, and Jackson counties, um, where I was last night over in um, Granby, if you know that area. And one of the um, reasons I ended up working on this bill um, to uh, take the hospital provider fee and reclassify it in a way that removes it from under the Tabor cap is because if we didn't pass this legislation, we were gonna be cutting about over $500 million from our, um, from our HICPA, our, our Medicaid budget basically, um, 250 million from the state and 250 million from the feds because the, the fees that we were collecting to fund for healthcare in Colorado was pushing us over our Tabor cap. Our Tabor cap is constitutional and we are not allowed to have more money in the state than what our Tabor cap allows. But we had this, this accounting maneuver to, to be able to keep the money and spend it on healthcare if we just um, created a separate entity to manage it and collect it and um, send it out to hospitals. And so it was, it sounds very, um, uh, technical and it was but it was also very heated and very political 
and is something we've been trying to do for years, but there was opposition to it because making this accounting maneuver meant that the government would be spending more money on health care. And that's a really controversial proposition right now. It meant that we were asking s people to vote for keeping this money in health care. And what really got folks to the table to change things is if we didn't do this, many rural hospitals were going to close. And I live in a rural, I, I don't live in a rural area, I represent rural areas, and several legislators from rural areas said, Our ho we won't have a hospital for hundreds of miles if this hospital closes, and the way we can stop that hospital from closing is pass this bill. And so um, with a lot of help from a lot of people, we did that. And one of the things we did in this bill is say that if there are going to be TABOR refunds, so if our budget once again gets over the TABOR cap, we are going to um, pay that money out through the senior homestead exemption. So do you all know what the senior homestead exemption is? It's, I'm sure you do. And it is um, costing the state more and more and more every year because more people are aging in place, which is a great thing, um, and, and they're aging overall, and that's just a cost to the state. And we said we want to protect the senior homestead exemption, and if we make it a TABOR refund, that's how we protect that because um, it'll always get paid out every other year, but if there's a TABOR, the, the time that the hospital, the senior homestead exemption is at risk is when we have to, one of the times it's at risk is when we make TABOR refunds because there's an extra stress on the budget. So we're gonna protect the senior homestead exemption in this bill by making it the means through which we do TABOR refunds. So it means seniors are the first to get refunds if we have to do TABOR refunds. And so that was just one of the ways that we um, kind of came to a compromise to find um, benefit for many people. And so it was um, it, it's a, was a controversial piece of legislation because some people, no matter what, are still opposed to it, and they tried to filibuster it on the second to last day of session. Um, and but we got it through, and um, if it withstands every legal challenge, then. Um, it'll be a real boon to rural hospitals, um, a real help to the senior homestead exemption. Um, there was a section in there that helped small businesses. So uh, we hit a lot in there, and I just thank you for um, recognizing the hard work that we did to pass this legislation. And also thank you for the work that you all did, and Ed came to testify in support of the bill. I'm not sure where he is now. There he is. Um, came to testify in support of the bill, and having that testimony always helps. It, it tells a story, it shows diverse support, and it means a lot to us, so thank you. Representative Casey Becker. Okay, at this time we're gonna have Jeanette come up and she's gonna talk about uh, becoming a citizen lobbyist and just what happened at the Capitol this year. Jeanette? Thank you. Well, we had to spend a lot of hours at the Capitol. How many of you guys have been to our state Capitol? Can you raise a hand? All right. How many of you have testified on a bill? Okay. Uh, yes, yes, Evie, you have. <laughs> um, how many of you have um, called your own legislator from within your district? Good, all right, good. Well, what we did this year is we spent way over 600 hours down at the Capitol um, testifying, being there in the presence. Sometimes we didn't even have to testify on the bill. We would just sit there in the front row and we all made sure we had our badges on so that they saw us, there is no denying, and believe me, they all got to know us very well. They recognized us. They're like, oh, senior lobby's here again, <laughs> which was good. That's exactly what we want. But the few individuals that were consistent down there is not enough. We need more. We need more volunteers to be there um, because it takes a lot of time to be down there. Um, Ed and I were down there two to three days a week, um, every Tuesday and Thursday, sometimes Wednesdays, sometimes Fridays. Um, the latest that um, I had to stay was, 
I think it was 1040 at night. Most of the time, you don't have to stay that late, um, but this was a very important bill that I wanted to make sure that they knew that seniors were there and it was important to them. So all the other bills had a lot of testimony. Obviously, by the time they came up for that bill, it was pretty late at night and everybody was tired and so fortunately they did pass it on so that was good. But um, it just, again, and that was on the, um, one of the adult protective services bill um, for the financial planners um, and stuff like that. So that's, that was one of them. So what we do down there is we go, um, Ed and I have provide training Okay, so last year we tried to do it at the, in early January, but unfortunately the day we picked, we had a heavy snowstorm. Eh, can't, can't control that. So that, that one actually got canceled, but what we started to do was to make sure that when people came down, we were in the um, cafeteria in the basement. We always made sure that we were sitting in, the, in there. Um, and then when anybody came new that came wanted you know wanted to learn about how to how to lobby or had an interest in it, um, then we just you know had them sit down and and did some training. We tried to do some training at the very beginning because at the first part of the session it's a little slow because they're introducing all of the bills. Okay, um, and so a lot of what we did, like I say, was going through and going through this whole process of how a bill becomes a law. Are you, does everybody know how that happens? Well, you need to come to our training if you don't know. Because <laughs> I'm not gonna spend, we can't spend the time today doing it. But come to our training and we will do it. Again, if you can't make it um, on the days where we have it set up, again, if we have another snowstorm or something, then you know, just come down to the Capitol because we still will be there and we will do one-on-one -on -one training. In fact, this year, what I'm hoping to do is to get a lot of the training um, on our website as well, so that that way people will have the information, you could kind of read through it, know a little bit more. But when you go through and testify on a bill, like I say, we, we talk about the bill on it. Um, and what we tend to do is, the first thing we do every day when we walk into the Capitol is we will go and get a schedule. We get the House calendar. Every day we'll tell you what's going on in the House and we get the Senate calendar. So it tells you what's happening on the floor and also what's happening in the different committees. Where, uh, what time the committees are being held. The time frames, you have to be very flexible um, because it all depends on what's happening on the floor. So if they say, oh, it's going to start, you know, at 1.30 in the afternoon. If you're the third bill, you don't know if you're gonna be there until, if that bill's gonna show, you know, be introduced at 1.45, or if it's gonna be five o'clock. So that's why we say we need more individuals to kind of help us out because we all have lives. You know, some of us have to go home and feed the dog, feed the cat, feed the kids, the grandkids, feed ourselves. So, um, what we, like I say, when we go through that, we, we get the calendar, and then we sit down and say, okay, who's going to go to which bill? Who feels comfortable testifying? We go through and we show everybody how to testify. Ed and I will go first and kind of... Um, have everybody kind of watch us on the first couple, te uh, when we testify in the first couple bills. And then we're there to support you, okay? We can help you write up whatever it is you want to say. We can give you the talking points. Um, we can also give you the pros and cons because you might get a question from one of the legislators. And you're going, uh-oh, now what do I do? I don't know what to say. It's okay. You can say, I don't have the answer to that. I don't know that. There's probably somebody else in the, in the room that could give you more information on that specific thing. So just because you testify does not mean you have to be an expert on the bill. We do ask that you testify um, with Colorado Senior Lobby's position. If you are going to testify for your own position, 
which might be different than senior lobbies, um, that's okay. You can do that, but we just ask, again, that you say, yes, I am a member of Colorado Senior Lobby, but this is my own personal testimony, okay? So don't be afraid. Don't be going, I don't agree with that, you know. Um, every Monday morning when we meet during the legislative session, that's when we discuss the bills. We go through and see the bills. Um, Ed and Rich, I don't know where Rich is. He's in the back. Go through and we they kind of pull the bills um, that have, you know, might have something to deal with seniors, okay? We also have people, everybody else in the room and on the phone that can say, hey, I heard about this bill. We need to discuss it or we need to look at it as well. So we discuss all the, bil the bills that we feel are relevant on Monday mornings. We then take a vote. Do we want to strongly support it? Do we support it? Are we neutral? Do so we just want to watch it? Do we oppose it? And do we strongly oppose it? Okay, those are the five different positions that we take. When we do those, um, if we strongly support and strongly oppose, those we for sure make sure that we can have somebody there to testify. We also send letters to the legislators, um, you know, those that are in the committee where it's going to be heard, and also the sponsors. So, um, you know, we've got a variety. Here's like a letter that was sent out. Um, we ask people to send, go ahead and send emails, you know, to them and to say this is what we support or don't support. Again, as you've heard over and over today, it's really important to tell your story, the personal piece of it. That is really what gets the attention. We also have fact sheets that we get. We sometimes write them up ourselves. We also have um, other agencies that have fact sheets. We sign our names onto the back saying we support it or we don't support it. Um, just like all of, the, all of you guys in here, if you belong to a specific organization or a business and you want to be able to say, hey, we want to work with, with Senior Lobby and we support this bill like you do, what Senior Lobby does, we'll add your name to it, okay? Because it's really important, again, for the legislators to see. It's also important to make sure you know who your own legislator is, you know, your Senate and your representative, um, so that that way you can talk to them. They know who you are. When you call, you say, I am one of, of your, rep I mean, you represent me. I live in your district. That's really, really strong and important. So besides going through all of these different things, um, in your packet, you guys have a... Let me find it. Sorry, I have too much paper up here. This is how I always am. <laughs> um, we have the scorecard in your packet, okay? Um, what this is, it is we went through a variety of different bills that Colorado Senior Lobby supported. We took the House and the Senate, and we went through as to how each of the legislators voted. Did they support it? Or did they oppose it? How many of them um, were, you know, or what percentage of them voted upon how Colorado Senior Lobby, um, what, how we voted? So again, it is, let me show you the front page so you can find it in your packet. It's this one right here. So if you look at it into the inside, you will go through and see. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go through every bill because, um, that for one thing, that will probably put you guys to sleep, and the other is that you guys can read. Uh, but I will tell you one thing. When you look at the different bills, this is something that is so, so important when you are reading the bills. Most of the time, people just pick them up and read what that bill says, okay? You have to go back to the state statute where that bill originated from. And that's what you need to see, how it is changing that full bill. So often people say, you know, get, oh, well, this is only a short bill, it's a paragraph. That paragraph can really affect services for our seniors. So it's really important to make sure you go back and read how this bill affects, how it changes the original law on there. So, um... 
like I say, you, you guys can go through and you can look at, at each of these. I want to kind of touch, sorry, I have so many papers. This is like my desk at home. <laughs> Paper is my downfall. Um, some of the important ones was, again, we had talked about it before, was House Bill 1253. Oh, let me tell you that. A lot of people don't know. What's the difference between, um, how do you know if it's a House bill or a Senate? A House bill always has four numbers, okay? Always. You'll see House bill 17, you know, um, 1253 versus Senate bill. Senate bills only have three numbers. So it would be Senate bill 1701. Oh, 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 one, or 123. Yeah, but, but they can have no more than three, yeah. They start out at one and go all the way up. So um, just because a lot of times people go, they may not say, you know, it's House Bill, they'll just go, oh, well, what do you think about 1253? And go, oh, I don't know what that is. <laughs> so just as a hint to kind of help you out. So 1253, again, was the uh, support the At-Risk Adult Protection Act. Okay, so this is one we've talked about. This is one that where we were saying now that uh, we wanted to make sure that um, adults were protected for financial areas, for fi financial planning. That's one of them. Another one we uh, worked on was, this is one was a huge one. Housing problem that demands notice. So this is expanding the notice to quit and the notice of rent increase. So a lot of times um, when individuals receive a notice, say um, that the rent's going to increase, they give them seven days notice. Now, if your rent's going to increase $400, which we're finding has happened quite a bit here in, in the Denver area, can you come up with that extra $400 in seven days? You know, most of us can't. So this is an, uh, one of the things that we're trying to say is that let's expand that to at least 21 days, okay? That will help everybody. Sorry, I almost spilled the water. <laughs> it, it just kind of helps everybody to be able to have a little more time for planning um, and to not be kicked out of their apartment right away or their home. So, again, these are just some of the bills that we go through. You can see that we have a lot of discussion about them. People are very passionate about them on our Monday morning meetings as well. Um, so, let me see if I wanted to. Here we go. Okay. So, we were actually at the Capitol, and we testified on 25 bills and we trained 17 members last session. Some people came back and were testifying. Some just um, didn't. They felt that it wasn't quite, they weren't quite comfortable doing it, but at least we trained them and they have the knowledge now. So when they do feel comfortable enough, they will be able to come back. If that's all that you need, please, we still open our arms up to say, please come in and we will help train you, okay? Um, of these, we, let me see it. Of them, 14 of the bills, of the 25 bills, were either signed by the governor or they uh, were on his desk or became law. Actually, I believe he signed all, every single one of them. Nine of them were postponed indefinitely or PI'd. PI'd means that they were killed. We went to the kill committee, um, as Ed talked about before. So, um, but we still testify in those committees. And we, had, we were testified 47 different times in the different committees. So you can see that we, we are down there a lot. We really need some additional help with it. Um, and now uh, what I'd like to do is to have a couple of our um, citizen lobbyists, those that uh, we trained, and then we go get everybody registered as a citizen lobbyist with the um, House of Rep with the representatives, right? The House of Representatives. Um, you get a little card. It's not a big deal, but it, but it is. It says you are an actually a citizen lobbyist, so you can carry that proudly. <laughs> so anyway, I'd, I'd like to have um, 
Diane Robinson come up and talk about, she, she was one of our citizen lobbyists and also Christina Johnson. Good morning. Um, just like Jeanette said, it's not hard to do. I have only lived in Colorado not quite three years, so I had a lot to learn. I had to figure out Tabor, Gallagher, the st all, th all those different things. It was like mind boggling. So I went down, I sat down with Jeanette, she went through a lot of things. They're very patient. They don't care if you ask the same question 10 times. You know, it's not, not hard. The thing is, when you find an issue that you're passionate about or something that affects you or a loved one or your aunt and uncle or can't say your grandparents, but you might have grandparents, you, you want to speak on their behalf because it's going to affect you. We're baby boomers, most of us, or we're heading there, and we're the greatest population increase other than the millennials. So you have to realize, like Ed showed on that slide, we're going to more than double in a few years, and there's no extra money not coming in from the state and certainly not from the feds. So you have to look at what do I really need? What might someone in my position need in the future? So it's those things that make you want to stand up. Yes, you're nervous. They let you sit there. They don't make you stand in front of them. <laughs> they won't see your knees knocking. So you, st you sit there and you just tell them how you feel about an issue. I know Ed's always telling me, write it down but I never write it down, just like now. <laughs> it's just, it's what's in your heart. You know, I worked in healthcare for many, many years, like 40 plus. So my heart is in healthcare and see the changes and how it affects us is so important. And most people don't realize the behind the scenes going on because medicine is very, very political. Whether you believe it or not, it's very political. So it's important that you come and you just tell your story. Like they said, you don't have to look up. You don't have to look at them. And if you don't know an answer, you can just say, I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to that. Or I'm uncomfortable answering that. You can just say what you want to say. It's not, they don't look at you in any way. They're very nice, they're very interested. And they really do pay attention. You can have all these big organizations come down and testify for a bill, and they're still looking at their phone or taking no doing whatever. But let a citizen get up there, and they stop, and they pay attention to what you have to say because you're what they're there to take care of and help and protect. And if you don't go, Somebody else will, and it might be a big company, and that big company is out to make a profit, and they're not going to really have your concern at heart. Some companies are great, but let's face it, they're not out there to give away their money. So I learned a lot of things. I really appreciate going to the Monday meetings. I have really enjoyed my time. I continue to be a loud mouth. I was before I came to Denver, so... It's not going to stop, and all I can say is, please come. Even if you just come and put on a volunteer badge and sit in the audience, you don't have to say it. Just see how your government works. There's so many ins and outs that you can get lost in the fine print. So I encourage you to come and try it out. We won't bite. We promise. We might even go somewhere for lunch that day. <laughs> My experience with lobbying <coughs> started as a person with a disability. I realized that my future and the uh, guarantee of 
being alive and having a good life depended on lobbying. So I'm a big believer in people being involved in government and showing up and testifying. As we've said, often telling your story can make a difference to a committee. Sometimes just hearing how a bill actually affects people can change somebody's mind and it can have a huge effect. So you might not feel like you're necessarily um, well-versed on every aspect of lobbying, but that doesn't matter. What you are versed on are issues that affect your life, things that you know about, things that you're passionate about. This is where you can help us and we need your help. So please come down and join us. Thanks. So it's not all just about doing that. You, I think you also see maybe on some of these slides, um, I made a bunch of cookies. I made over 500 some cookies and we took them to each of the legislators, you know, gave them, you know, three or four cookies each. Sometimes they were going, what, what's this for? You know, and we're like, we just want to, we don't want anything. We just wanted to, to let you know we're here. We're seniors. We just wanted to say here's, thank you for your work and here's lunch, which a lot of them said, thanks for lunch today. <laughs> Um, so it was just kind of a fun thing to do. So it's just, um, you know, a great way to, to meet new people, have fun, socialize, make cookies, make whatever you want, actually. <laughs> but I tell you what, food really helps. <laughs> so um, let me open this up to questions. Who's got any questions for us? <coughs> Trying to get out of the way. I just want to get this mic. Oh, yeah. Just a second. We're going to get a mic so we can make sure... We can hear you. The lady back there in the. <coughs> How do you learn about the training sessions? Okay. We will have them posted on our website. We probably will send it out in our newsletter. So if you are, um, give us your email. We'll make sure that we send you the information. Uh, we haven't set a date yet. We probably need to start thinking about setting the date, um, at, you know, so we can kind of get it. Going, yeah, this is this is kind of how a bill becomes a law. It gets very confusing, but <laughs> we we will tend again. If you can't make the one or two days that we actually have a training, then uh, we will, you know, kind of do it on the fly with people. We also talk about um, a lot of the budget, going through the budget process because it's really difficult to see the long bill and to understand what that means. And so we kind of did a training. Uh, right before the long bill came out about how this thing's impact, what this really means, how to read it, and where all the money for seniors is because it's in a lot of different state departments. When do they meet? Um, we meet uh, every, during the session we meet every Monday and we meet at the Disability Law, is that the name of it, the full? Yeah. Okay. Alzheimer's Association building, which is at, what is it? Fourth and, yeah, 455 Sherman. Okay. And we meet at 9 o'clock, 9 oh, to 9.30, 9.30 to 11.30. Um, you can also call in. Um, but during the session, we meet ev every Monday, um, which starts January, uh, the second Wednesday in January is when the session starts. So... Um, but we meet starting in January every Monday through the end of the session, which is the second Wednesday in May is when they convene usually. And then, you ca again, you can call in. You can go onto the website. You can call in if you cannot physically make it there. Um, and make sure you give your opinions and vote um, on the bills. Does that answer? Okay. Um, in the back there. use of Medicare and Medicaid. I want to know what your organization is doing because um, the um, uh, chief editor at U.S. News and World Report, a strong Democrat, and I can't remember his name at off the top of my head right now, but he informed Obama that IBM came up with $900 billion of waste, fraud, and abuse in Medicare and Medicaid, and Obama decided to do nothing about that. We have to start attacking that the fraud 
and the um, because we're talking about budgets here we're talking about what kind of medical treatment will we get and we can't do that if we don't kind of um, got the system of the fraud that's a very good question um, we I will tell you for senior lobby we mostly focus on stuff in within the state but we do focus on the federal um, in the areas of health care and stuff and so what again what we do is we look at the different bills that are introduced um, to be able to discuss those and to take a, a, our opinion on those um, as to some of the um, I do understand that yes there is a lot of abuse um, in the whole medical system actually in every system <laughs> you know you're gonna find it in in everywhere um, so what we do is we c we kind of go down and testify on behalf of those things things that we know but we need to make sure we have our facts you can't just go in and just say well this is what we think uh, because then we lose credibility so we need to make sure we have our facts and that's why we kind of meet on our Monday mornings and decide who's going to go and testify and do they need assistance with um, being able to testify do they need talking points and all that stuff so it was a great question two questions um, the telephone number to call for dial-in meetings is it is eight 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 five three seven 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 one five that's the reception that is Monday mornings and then you put in a code and I've got that number as well four seven two two zero three zero zero pound and then press star six to mute <laughs> Yeah, when, when people are, are calling in, it's really important that pe that we ask people to mute it because we have dog barkings, uh, you have kids crying, you just have uh, conversations and stuff like that. So, um, but yes, call in any every Monday. Our s again, if you can't, if you don't, if you didn't get that number written down, it's on our website, which is uh, coloradoseniorlobby.org. Uh, and the uh, second question is, um, how do you actually join as a volunteer? I know I'm also looking at AARP's advocacy that meets on Mondays as well. They've sent me an application. What's your process? Our process is very simple. You just sign up. You can even just send us your email. Uh, you can give it, write that down for today and give it to Corinne, and Corinne will get you. Corinne is right back here. Yes, and, and it is, there is a packet because we um, asked kind of like, how, how did we do today? Tell us what, what we needed to change and all that stuff. So, okay, we have a question here. It's actually more of an answer to a previous question regarding Medicare and Medicaid and um, fraud. Um, Medicare is dealt with um, fully on a federal level, not a state level, but Medicaid, the state does, um, is in control of Medicaid in terms of the reimbursements. And um, a, a few years ago, um, I heard that most of the fraud that takes, takes place in terms of Medicaid is actually providers, not, not the individuals who are trying to get coverage, but providers sending in uh, for reimbursement when they, they didn't really have those patients or they didn't really prescribe that medication. And the state was uh, doing its best to buckle down on that. And uh, what was your third one? Medicare, Medicaid, and I thought you had a third one. Oh, okay, just Medicare and Medicaid? Okay, so the state can't do anything about Medicare. That's between you and the federal government. But Medicaid, um, the state 
does um, have oversight of that and they, they monitor it very closely. Um, and um, they, they do a really good job of making sure that the people who get it are actually eligible to get it. Um, and, and, and it's a little harder to track when providers put in a claim for reimbursement that they don't deserve. But I, I was shocked to learn that the fraud, almost all the fraud that takes place in, in Medicaid is actually from providers. Um, who else had a question? I kind of had two. One was piggybacking on this. Audience. Who do you contact if you know of an absolute Medicare, Medicaid fraud of a company doing business that's absolutely black you and white fraud? I mean, it's in writing type stuff. We have a, a representative. Oh, let me. Let me. Yes, I'm with Centera Healthings, and we have a ship. Sorry, we're, we're with Centera Healthings, and we have a ship department in our team. You can call the ship line, and there are cards in the back here. They're white and blue to call them. They can report it to the, se the sen Senior Medicare Patrol, and we help do the first line of appeal, so that goes out to the federal level in Maryland, and they can fight those appeals. So if you know of some type of fraud, it's very simple to call into the, that ship line. Thank you. And I'm so SHIP stands for the Senior Health Insurance Program. We want to make sure we don't just use um, acronyms that you don't know. <laughs> my, my other question was, I don't know, I'm, I mean, I, sometimes I think I'm pretty intelligent. Other times I'm like, I'm so ignorant. Um, with this regards to notice for like rent increase and stuff, at one time it used to be 30 days. Just like you had to give 30 days notice before you moved out. They had to give you 30 days notice to raise the rent or change or, or tell you we're going to, you know, if you're renting a house, we, we want to keep this house, we want to sell, blah, 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 blah. When did that change and why is it, are you only going for the 21 instead of the fair 31? Because if you tell me in seven days or 10 days or 15 days that you're going to raise my rent 400, I, well, I can't move because I have to give you 30 days notice. Um, to be honest with you, I don't know when that changed um, in the lie. I, I, don't, I don't have a history on that piece of it. Um, but yes, that is something that we were finding and also a lot of evictions. Um, you would get the notice and have to be out within three days. You know, so it's, it's, those are some of the things that we want to focus on this coming year. We want to continue to focus on affordable housing, um, senior housing, make sure that it's available for them. Another area we're look, looking at is the homestead exemption. Um, I, you know, I think it was uh, Representative, who was it that said? Yeah, Representative Young. Um, and let's see, what was the other one? Oh, uh, to get more funding uh, for the Older Americans Act, uh, for state funding for that. Um, I know that that's one of the bills. Uh, I think there we're looking at maybe increasing it by four million is kind of what we're working on, and what other ones? You guys remember? Yes. Uh, we were looking for what other, uh, the major ones that we're gonna be focus looking at for this year. So again, it's the mobile home, mobile homes. Uh, that's a big one because we have a lot of our seniors and individuals with disability in the mobile homes, and that's an area we really want to provide a lot of protection on, too. Binding arbitration for the mo mobile homes? Uh, one of the concerns we have is that most of the nursing home and all assisted living, you're actually agreeing to binding arbitration when you sign those, con <coughs> those contracts. So you give up the, your basic legal rights on that. And one of the concerns, besides the mere fact you give that up probably without knowing it, is that binding arbitration is biased towards the people that will keep using them versus the one-time user. So it's, at, as it exists now, it's a real question as to how fair a process it is. Okay, any other questions? Okay, 
Well, then um, I'd like to go ahead and turn this over to Diane, uh, who's going to be talking about how you can get involved and how you can make a big difference. I'm sorry? Oh, did I? I'm sorry. I <laughs> okay, so come on up. <laughs> sorry, I was. Good morning. Again, my name is Kelly Horton. I'm with uh, Dementia Connection Coalition. We provide education and advocacy throughout the community, including first responders on uh, the over 130 different types of dementia and how they might present. Okay. But with that being said, I'm going to backtrack a little bit. Uh, I've been asked to speak briefly about our Monday morning meetings and give you a little bit deeper overview on that. And part of my background is, in addition to being in the senior industry for over 25 years, I'm also a certified personal historian. So I help individuals as they're aging look back and tell the stories of their lives, the things that were important to them, their values, the things that they want to pass on to their children and grandchildren. And that's something that really appealed to me in regards to Colorado Senior Lobby. Because if you think about it, it really is an opportunity for us to give a voice to the decisions being made today, not only for ourselves, but also for our children and grandchildren as well. And part of that then includes our meetings on Monday. Big jump there, but stay with me. <laughs> what I mean by that is Monday morning meetings, first of all, we've touched on this already. I'm repeating a couple of things. But uh, during the legislative session, we actually meet every Monday morning beginning at 9.30 to 11.30. We're at 455 Sherman Street. And Sherman, as many of you know, is just uh, the next block over uh, east of Broadway. And we're in between 4th and 5th Avenue and, or Street. And uh, also Spear runs just north of that Alzheimer's building. We're on the first floor in the conference room. A lot of people get there a little early, get their place set up, that type of thing. We set up the phones. The other thing that happens, which is I find very um, good, and it makes it easy for me to attend the meetings on Monday, is uh, over the weekend, either Ed and or Rich will put together the legislation or the bills that have been introduced since our previous meeting. So we actually get to go on this website, and the website is very user-friendly, if you haven't been on it yet. But it will show you specifically, you'll see the link there, to click on to look at the bills that maybe we've already talked about, are we going to support, oppose, or monitor, or the new bills that have been introduced during that week so you can look at them ahead of time. Now, I don't know about anybody else, but I can tell you from my own personal experience, when I was out in the field in the healthcare industry, someone was talking about working healthcare industry, there was legislation coming down the pike all the time. And I remember, for example, with mandatory reporting, I was a care provider. I knew nothing about mandatory reporting. I had a resident fall. The police showed up, the firefighter, everybody, where it had been something, it was just kind of, it wasn't a true fall. It was a slide out of a chair. But we just wanted to make sure that person was safe. That's how I heard about mandatory reporting. This is an opportunity where either you can make a difference in whether the bills are being passed or not and moved into law, or it's an opportunity to just use your voice, to be able to ask the questions, is this in line with what I want for the future for myself, my parents, or my children, or is this something that I can get behind and truly support and then testify at the Capitol? It all begins here on Monday mornings. 
Now the other thing is we talked about call-in. We have a number of people that call in. Of course we would prefer to have you there in person. There is so much interaction and there's a lot of opportunity to ask questions. You do not need to be an expert. We all have our areas of strengths, but that's when we come together in these meetings and that's how we make the difference. We all speak from our own experience and we tell our stories there to begin with. Now, once we look at the bills, um, the first thing we do is we look at those new bills, as I mentioned, and then we discuss them. Sometimes we're able to move forward very quickly and either vote to strongly support or support, strongly oppose or oppose. But what we find quite often is that we vote to monitor because it's a new bill, we're just not sure that we want to put our stamp on it one way or the other. We also ask for each of the individuals, the volunteers that are there in the meeting, to raise their hand or to offer to follow that bill. Then at that point, they're the ones that report back to all of us what's going on. Is it being, um, has it been assigned to a PI so that it's been killed? Or um, is it being heard? Or, you know, those types of things. They're the ones that are following the bill specifically. And we can have as many people as want to follow a bill as want to be a part of it. Matter of fact, we encourage that as well. And we like to hear both sides. Now, if we monitor... The other thing is sometimes, for example, uh, Rich quite often knows how a bill might move because he's been doing this and following bills for a while. He can say, you know what, I think there's going to be an amendment to that. Well, we may not want to support or oppose a bill until we know what the amendment is, that type of thing. So everything is very simple, very clear, but I guess the thing I want to make sure that I am communicating is as scary as it was to me the first time I walked into the senior lobby, and I was, because I thought, boy, I don't know enough about everything that's going on. This is a group of individuals that care about the aging population. We don't always agree on things. We get into some discussions but isn't that what this is all about? Is the opportunity to feel safe to say, I agree with you or I don't agree with you, and to know that people are listening. And I want to do that for them as well. Now, I want to um, also let you know that this uh, coming Monday on the 21st, our meeting will actually begin at 9 o'clock, not 9.30. And we have, I need my readers as well, um, we will uh, be listening to a representative from the Colorado Commission on Affordable Health Care who will present the commission's recently, re recently released report and future activities. Plus there will be a representative of the Colorado Consumer Health Initiative who will be there to discuss their work on the prescription drug issues at the state level. So please join us at 455 Sherman Street at nine o'clock. And then I just have one quick quote that I'm gonna leave you with. Freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it to our children in our bloodstream. It must be fought for, protected, and handed on for them to do the same. Or one day, we will spend our sunset years telling our children and our children's children what it was once like in the United States where men were free. Ronald Reagan. Thank you. Karin? Oh, okay. <laughs>
Um, Corinne, did you want to come up and talk about the website at all, or do you want to wait on that? Okay. All righty. So the domain name is coloradoseniorlobby.org. We have a news and events page. We post not only our events, but other events from the different people and organizations we network with. Everything we've been talking about in regard to the legislative committees, we're putting that on the website and we're just trying to do a better job all the time. So if you can't find something you're unsure, please go to the website, explore it. We're really trying to get a lot of details there for you to uh, um, just be able to be connected with what we're doing. So, coloradoseniorlobby.org. Okay. At this time, I just wanted to say a few words about getting involved uh, in the Colorado Senior Lobby. Just a quick review. I'm a, I'm a volunteer at the Colorado Senior Lobby. I'm also in the senior industry. I'm the director of a retirement community. I'm a certified senior advisor, and I'm also a candidate to, to be on the board here of um, the Colorado Senior Lobby. So I don't have to tell you that the current um, political uh, uh, situation right now is a very trying time. I, it's been very challenging for me to just process everything that's, that's been going on. Um, and that's why I'm so proud of all of you for being here today, for actually caring and wanting to get involved or at least just wanting more information about what's going on in the Colorado legislature. Um, one of the biggest reasons why I got involved is because I work at a retirement community and, and I see what goes on. So our community is one that accepts Medicaid and I know Medicaid is, has been brought up here. So um, most communities, most retirement communities do not take Medicaid and the reason why is because the reimbursement rate that is given to communities per individual is so low that communities cannot make it work financially to accept Medicaid, so they just don't do it. But we still have millions of people on Medicaid out there, and what do they do? So let me tell you the desperate phone calls I get. It's, it's really hard to, to feel these calls every day and then go home. I mean, people tell me, if I don't find something, I'm homeless. I'm living under a bridge in two weeks if you can't help me. So, of course, I try and um, refer them on to, like, Dr. Cog or government agencies that can help them. But the government agencies aren't really being funded the way they need to be funded. So they're not staffed properly. You're on hold forever. Um, and, and, and so it's, uh, so we have desperate families and, and they're reaching out, but they're just not really getting the help that, that they need. So by getting involved with the Colorado Senior Lobby, you can let your voice be heard. That's what we need to do. And, and some of us in here are baby boomers, like me, and um, there's 80 million of us that's coming up uh, here and we need to have our voices be heard because if we remain silent, the politicians are going to make their decisions and you're going to have to live with them. So I really want to strongly encourage you uh, to get involved. Um, by getting involved with the Colorado Senior Lobby, I can assist in educating our legislators about um, issues that are really critical to seniors and perhaps we can influence their decisions to assist seniors uh, in getting adequate services and funding because it's only going to get worse here. We have 80 million of me coming up and some of us have saved and we have money in the bank and some of us have not and I'm really worried about the ones who you know don't have those high incomes. What's going to happen to them? So in today's rushed world, most of us don't have time really to get involved uh, with organizations like ours. That's okay. You can still get involved by donating to our organization. That money then helps us mobilize and do what we need to do to influence our legislators. So if you can't 
give us your time, and we'd love for you to give us your time, but I understand you're very, very busy. So instead, um, we have included here a form, and you can also jump on the website as well, to contribute to our organization, so that way you are participating, but you're just not doing, um, you're not you know, going to the meetings, but you're participating by supporting us financially, and that's really gonna help us. So we'll do the work, we're more than happy to do the work, um, and of course I want uh, again to encourage you to go to the website for any kind of updates. Our two major events of the year are the Senior Day at the Capitol, which is in March. Is that right? Yeah, usually in March. And then this event here, our Summer Social. So I want to thank you so much for allowing me to, to encourage you to get involved. Um, like I said before, it doesn't matter if you give your time or your money. Your participation is what's most important to us. So if we don't get involved, we have to live with the decisions of our politicians. So let's make sure our voices are heard, okay? Um, so the last thing I wanna talk about in, in addition to the donation form is uh, you should have received an evaluation form in your materials. And we would really, really appreciate if you would just let us know what you thought of this, what you'd like to hear more of, what you didn't, I, um, just, just any kind of feedback at all because we want to improve this and make it better for next year, okay? So thank you so much, everyone, for coming. And uh, Jeanette has a few. Thanks. Um, we have Representative Steve Lebsack. He just came in. Did, did you want to come on up and say a few words? Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Steve Lebsock, and I'm a state representative. Um, it's been really an honor to serve the people of Colorado the last five years down at the state capitol. I'll tell you one real quick story. I wasn't prepared to spe speak, but thank you very much. Um, one thing comes to mind. Um, so several years ago, I was talking to a Gold Star wife. Does everybody know what a Gold Star um, spouse is? And she was telling me how she was taking care of her veteran right, for the last several years of his life. And they enjoyed a program that's a very important program. It's a lot like the homestead exemption for seniors who have lived in their home for 10 years. It, it is actually, if you're a 100% disabled veteran, then you get half of your property tax off, right? And so you and your spouse um, living in your home um, enjoy that, that right. And um, her veteran passed away and so they, hadn't, they weren't seniors yet, um, but he was a 100% disabled veteran. And so as soon as the veteran died, she lost that benefit, right? And I couldn't believe that the state of Colorado was doing that to spouses of 100% disabled veterans. And so I ran a bill when I got into this position. Um, I think it was my second year, or maybe it was my, you remember what year that was, Rick? I don't remember what year that was, was that 2015? Anyway, the year's kind of, maybe it was 2015. And so we passed that bill and we said that when the veteran dies, the spouse of that veteran keeps that benefit um, until that spouse remarries, right? And so um, it can happen both ways. It could be that the, the wife is the 100% disabled veteran or it could be that the husband is 100% disabled veteran. So we passed that. And so um, th those are the types of things that I've worked on. Um, at the, the state capitol for the last five years, and there's been others. I'm, I'm currently running for state treasurer, and, um, and I'm, I'm looking forward to being your next Colorado state treasurer. Are we, are we in Westminster here? So I'm a graduate of Westminster High School. Um, so for those of you who are from um, Westie, um, we're gonna have a Westminster High School graduate as your next Colorado state treasurer, but one, oops, um, one, uh, one thing I wanted to mention, um, do we have any retired state employees here? Anybody at one? Only one? What about retired teachers? Okay, there's a couple retired teachers. And so one thing, a lot of folks don't even know what the treasurer does, right? But one thing that the treasurer does do is 
sits on the pair board. And so you, ma'am, in the back row, you're going to have a person sitting on the pair board who actually believes that we've made you a promise, right? I've made you a promise saying that if you're willing to be a teacher for 20 years, we know that you're not going to make as much money as you would if you go into the private sector, but we're going to make a promise to you that you're going to have para at the end of the day, right? You're not going to get Social Security, but you are going to get para. And so I'm going to protect that for you. And we're going to, I'm looking forward to looking at the para association's um, recommendations to the legislature next month to see how we can make it more solvent. But we're not going to do anything detrimental to your para. Let me um, tell you that right now. But anyway, um, I didn't want to, thank you. Um, so that, that's all I'm going to talk about. I w really wasn't prepared to speak, but thank you very much for having me um, speak for a few minutes. And um, the senior lobby and, and organizations like the senior lobby is very important down at the Capitol. I appreciate Ed and, and others coming down to the Capitol regularly and making sure that we vote the right way. And so keep up the good work. Thank you. Hello, everyone here. Um, thank you for having me. Uh, this was very unexpected. My name is Ed Britt. I am a state legislature candidate for House District 4, which is west and northwest Denver. And I briefly want to mention that um, I've been working with individuals, uh, and I wish to hear more issues from you guys. But currently, I've been informed that it's quite potential that the property tax rebate may be under attack next legislative session. And I've looked at ways of both maintaining what we currently have and other options so we can continue uh, giving those the most in need uh, breaks that they deserve as they've helped raise us and make our younger generations what we are today. And uh, some of them, if you're not aware, if it does come under fire, is a, a property tax circuit breaker, which essentially gives tax breaks uh, for property owners um, that are above 65 and in some cases uh, younger than that, but generally in 65 and, and older, uh, the ability um, to maintain their tax breaks through uh, income and maintaining that uh, level so they continue to have their tax breaks. And of course we need to look at uh, affordable housing options and continue um, looking at strengthening um, uh, rental rights for individuals. And there is, uh, with the uh, property tax circuit break, which I do, I, unfortunately I don't have copies of this, but I do have some studies on it, but there is ways that it's also passed along to individuals that are renting also. So um, I would love to further this discussion with individuals that are here uh, later uh, after the program is over. And I do apologize for my dress as I thought summer social meant an outside event. So um, <laughs> please, please forgive me. And uh, again, my name's Ed Britt and I will be here uh, until the end. And if you guys have issues um, that you have that I may be unaware of, please bring them to my attention as I would love to listen, learn, and help represent the senior lobby. So thank you for your time and uh, have a great day. And Talk soon. Thank you. Um, I just want to remind everybody, I don't know if it was said clearly or not, but we are a nonpartisan group, okay? So just so that you know, we definitely have Democrats, Republicans, and Independents, and we listen to everyone, as Kelly has said. Um, so, uh, but again, we, we do discuss everything, and we make sure we take a position that Colorado Senior Lobby, everybody votes upon. So again, we don't always agree, but if you're gonna testify, you do, you do need to take Colorado Senior Lobby's position when you testify. Um, so if you guys could please leave your evaluation forms on the table back there that's got the red tablecloth on it, we certainly would appreciate it. Um, does anybody have any other questions for anybody? Did we do a good job, Ben? <laughs> okay. So anyway, please go ahead and fill it out, and um, we'll give a short break, and then we're going to have our board. Uh, we're going to have our business meeting for Colorado Senior Lobby's business meeting. Yeah, everyone's welcome to stay at that, and we'd ask you to come down closer for that. Uh, 
Steve, who was just talked a minute ago, was the person who was the inspiration for this chart behind us when he sat there in the testimony on a bill and said, we got to realize we really just make spaghetti down here way too much. So in spite of all the organization and plans they do, it, it's, not as, it's not a real clean, simple process. Uh, at any rate, we want to get started with the business meeting right away. It, although we'll take a break if everyone wants to go to the restroom. And everyone's certainly willing to participate. First, I'd like to thank you all for coming. Second, we have our annual membership meeting right after. If anyone signed up, you are members. So you're welcome to stay and vote. Just think, it should only be about 20 minutes, a half hour or so. It should go pretty fast and let's, there's, there are some controversial issues. But uh, remember, if you signed up, you're members. So uh, thank you for coming. There's still some, uh, some refreshments remaining. Uh, we'll take a break now and Come back in about 10 minutes. <laughs>